Welcome back to the Preacher Boys podcast. On today's episode, I'm sitting down with Emmy-winning director Sharon Lees. Sharon is the director of Let Us Pray, a four-part documentary series exposing abuse within independent fundamental Baptist churches. On today's episode, we talk about working on this project for over three years, some of the things that she wished she didn't have to cut from the final project, and her biggest takeaways as someone who is experiencing the IFB for the very first time through this documentary series. We cover all this and so much more, and you're not going to want to miss a single second. So here's my interview with Sharon Lees. All right, Sharon, welcome to the show. Nice to be here. The roles are reversed. I know. I was going to say, it feels good to have you on the other side of the camera. I guess we're both on camera, but I get to ask you the questions, which is which is pretty exciting. And uh, as everybody already heard in the intro, you directed Let Us Pray, which has made quite a splash. It was in the top 10 on Max for the last couple of days, which is pretty cool. And uh, it's made some splashes of positive feedback, and there's been some negative feedback. Uh, some pastors and IFB faithfuls have said there's an agenda behind this project. So I want to know from you as the director, what was your agenda starting Let Us Pray? Um, well, I usually go into my projects with um, with a lot of curiosity. So I will definitely say that uh, my agenda was to follow my curiosity. Um, I also tend to do very female-centric kind of work. So, um, so really, I, I just really wanted to amplify the voices of these women. I mean, I felt like that was just really important. I felt like I almost had a duty to once, um, once I heard their stories. So if there's any agenda, it's to do authentic storytelling and to amplify, um, the voices of truth. I know when we first had our conversation, which was, I mean, three years ago about um, sitting down and just first discussing just, hey, here's a bunch of information and and kind of laying out the everything from who is Jack Hiles to, you know, why do people swallow goldfish, which I know, <laughs> I know was a point of big interest. Um, you know, my biggest concerns early on were, what's the angle and approach to this? And is this going to be something that could be just slapped away as a hit piece or could be slapped away as sloppy or, and it's decidedly not any of those things. And uh, one of the big things I've continuously said is the way that this documentary portrays everything it, you walk away going, this is undeniable. Like if you won't engage with this, the information is clear cut. It's there. It's fact. You have to choose what you do with it. And uh, you mentioned following the curiosity and a question that many of my listeners have been asking is, did the director have any experience with the IFB? Why focus on this project? And um, you did not. Uh, you didn't have experience with the IFB. What was it about these stories and the Star Telegram report that really stood out to you? Uh, yeah, because it did, uh, it did um, emerge from reading the, the articles that were, I read it in the Kinsey star, but it was, um, from the Fort Worth, um, star telegram and, and Sarah Smith's incredible writing and investigative research. I was just amazed at there was that there was this church that I had never, and churches that I had never heard of. I had never heard of the IFB. And then when I found out how ubiquitous it is and how they, uh, the shuffle, uh, you know, how they, uh, shuffle the pastors and how so much abuse was happening and it was yeah. happening right now. And all these women were coming forward. I, uh, that's what I got curious about. I was like, I, this isn't the, it isn't the Catholic church. It's, it's not a church that I've, that I've heard of. And, um, and then these women's stories, they were so brave to, to tell them and, and speak up. And, um, you know, I like to do to tell stories that um, that help people, you know, get a window into a part of the world that they might not be aware of, and maybe even change something about the world mm. that, we, that really, you know, desperately needs to be changed. So that was um, those were some of the things that that had attracted me to to it. Did you have any religious background or was this completely this idea of religious indoctrination? Was it a completely foreign thing to you? Uh, completely foreign. Mm. 
Yeah. Uh, that's so my background is, um, you know, I was uh, raised Jewish. Hmm. Um, so even Christianity is, uh, I wouldn't say foreign, but not, I'm not as familiar with it. And, um, but then hearing all, yeah, the swallowing goldfish and, um, you know, all the discipline, um, I, I just, um, it was, it was all very shocking to me. Yeah. That's fascinating to me because as you can imagine, when I meet someone who doesn't have any religious background, like or at least a Christian religious background, I can't even fathom as someone who grew up from the time I was like, could first form thoughts. I was being told God, Jesus, heaven, hell, like, so it's always running in the background. And so it's interesting seeing someone with fresh eyes, look at the denomination specifically, but just religion as a whole and how it affects people's belief systems and, and life and marriages and these abuse cases and, and so many different factors. Like the fear of God. I, yeah. you know, I've always heard that term, but never really knew what the fear of God meant. And I learned about it by in, in the process yeah. of doing this documentary and people have a real fear of going to hell. Yes, we do. <laughs> very, very real. Um, I'm curious in stepping into it because going back to one of my fears when I initially heard about the project was it was equal parts excitement, equal parts fear. I was excited that someone with fresh eyes was going to be looking at this. I was also scared that, okay, someone who's not familiar with it might have a hard time explaining it, breaking it down, seeing the connections, all the different circles. And you know, you see it in the documentary, all these little pinpoints and mm -hmm. threads to everywhere. From the time you started back in 2019 to the time that this actually was finished, at what point in that process did you feel like you had a good enough grasp to start rolling cameras on this and start shooting? Like, did you have a lot of pre-production where it's like, let's actually figure out the the layout first, or was it let's just shoot and figure it out as we go? It was probably more let's shoot and figure out as we go. Um, what happened was we so I read the articles and then I got a hold of Sarah Smith, and then it took her some time. Um to contact the women to see if anyone was willing to, to speak to us. And then it was just uh, basically me and Samantha Hake uh, just contacting women and uh, hearing their stories. And then uh, there were some things happening uh, in Gaylord, Michigan, and Ruthie was going there. And, uh, and the blind eye movement was, um, was just really kind of getting off the ground, and they were going to have a big meeting um, at the same time that, uh, that the, that Grace Baptist was also having a meeting. And so they were all congregating there and we're like, this is something we probably need to capture. Yeah. And so we quickly, um, just on our own before we had any funding, um, Sam went and, uh, with a very small crew and met Ruthie and, um, did the first interview with Ruthie and um, and with some of the other women. And um, we, I think she was there for three days and mm. we just got some amazing footage. Um, and that was the footage that then we used to create a sizzle reel, which is what you use to, to pitch the project out. For those listening, like there were periods when you guys reached out, you'd already shot a little bit. And then throughout like every couple months, it was like, Hey, here's this, or can we get this? And Almost to the point, like I would forget something's happening, and then you'd reach back out. I'm like, oh, something's happening, and then it just kept snowballing. And then by the end, it was like, oh, stuff's happening all the time, and we're getting really close to this releasing. Ruthie happened to be going through these series of events at the time that these stories are coming out. You connect with her. For the other people involved in the project, was it just a natural progression of? This person's connected to this person. Like, how did you go about choosing? Hey, these are kind of our main characters, so to speak, throughout this series. Wow. I mean, we had so many women's stories that we wanted to tell. Um, and we knew we wanted to show the expanse and the ge the geographic reach of all of the of the women who had been abused. So we didn't want to just focus on on Gaylord, where um, where Ruthie, you know, was really where her first uh, time abuse had happened. So we um, we kind of looked at it geographically. We also wanted uh, the stories to be somewhat different, um, 
And it was also um, based on who was willing to really um, go deep with us because it's a huge decision for um, for women who um, you know have that kind of trauma and abuse in their life. So I get it. And there were women who we started um, filming with who then decided that they that it was too much for them to be talking about it. Um, or there were women who we feel may have been threatened um, to back out. And so there were a number of reasons why we kind of chose the the women that we did that we were able to focus on. So part of it was our choosing and part of it was was their choosing as well. And, you know, in terms of availability and who's available, who's available most that we can really do their story justice because we could spend enough time with them. And and I appreciate this too, because I've dealt with a lot of journalists. I've dealt with a lot of victims who've dealt with journalists before, podcasters, YouTubers, news channels. And a lot of times these stories can be approached from an outside perspective with a lot of judgment or a lack of empathy or, hey, we just want to create something and you happen to be available and we're going to put you through the ringer to create our product. Um, And I don't get that sense at all from any point in the project with you or with Sam, who's also amazing. And I should have actually had her come on with you because she's she's been so great through this process too. I, I'm curious, where did you find that balance of diving deep into the gritty details of these stories without bordering into exploitation or unnecessarily re-traumatizing survivors? I did get a sense there's times where you go, this is your chance to tell your story in as real and as raw a way as possible. But I didn't feel you putting that pressure to say, let's go for shock value. Let's push this direction. Like, let's have this cold clinical approach to get the most out of you. Like, how did you draw that balance as a director? Wow. Uh, it was a tough balance. And I really appreciate you noticing that because it was really, um, you know, something that Sam and I talked about a lot. And we, um, because the interviews, like she did some interviews and I did other interviews. And, um, it's a lot to listen to those stories. It's even more to, to tell those stories. And, um, we wanted people to, um, say, we wanted the women to say what they wanted to say. And what's interesting is that in, t- at times, uh, it seemed like the women were telling even greater detail than we ever, um, than we ever put on the air. Um, because we didn't, we didn't want to be triggering for others, but we also wanted to, listen to the stories. I mean, when you are in, on a roll and you're telling your story, uh, we don't want to say like, we don't want to hear that part. Um, mm-hmm. so that's part of the story. And that's, we want it to be cathartic for them. So, um, but we did make some very specific choices in the edit to not go into some of the graphic detail, um, that women shared. And, um, and I really feel like, uh, they appreciated that because I know specifically Ruthie, um, right before it aired, asked about specific scenes and things she had said, and she seemed very happy that um, that there were things that we that we we didn't include, um, and we didn't include those sometimes for time, but many times because we um, we just didn't think it was necessary. It was necessary for them to let us know their story so that we we had a deeper understanding because we're the ones holding these stories and putting them out in the world. So I think it was important for us to hear um, more than, than we actually shared. I love that you added that, that it was good for you to know because you're approaching it, even if it's not shown on screen, that context is there in how you're approaching everything else. And when you're making decisions in what to cut or what is important, some things like you mentioned had to be cut for time. I have to imagine, I know just from my experience filming, there's a lot that did not make the cut. And I know I was only there for a day. Some were there for three days or four days and, you know, some even longer than that. Was there anything that was cut because it had to be cut? It just didn't fit that you wish people could have seen? Yeah, there was actually more to Jamie Hiles' story um, that we had to cut. Um, It was for time, but it was also like there are stories that are, were self-contained. Um, and so you, um, look at those and big chunks that you can take out. And there were more things that we filmed with, um, with Jamie, um, that we actually never didn't include, um, like her trying to 
figure out because she was adopted if David Hiles was in fact uh, her dad. Wow. Um, wow. Because there was a rumor that he actually was and that he adopted her um, because um, because he had gotten someone, you probably know this story, you probably know it better than me, had gotten, uh, uh, had raped a 16-year-old girl and then she was um, impregnated and he wanted to have the baby. Hmm. So, um, so there was, so we did, um, so she actually, um, uh, did a DNA test. Hmm. So we were, we, we filmed that did, and then we never used it. Did you get results? We did. I don't know if I should share though, cause it's not in there. Okay. They asked Jamie Hiles. Yeah. I'd be curious to know, um, that, and, and I, I'm curious for those segments, you know, I know the series is what the series is. Is there any chance that any of that could be used in a future way or released as a separate thing? Is there any plans for that? Or is it something where that would be a whole nother, it's a whole nother project to take on at that point? Well, I think it is possible because, um, you know, if there's, uh, if, if ID decides that they want to do a second season, we could then go back to some of the footage and, and resurrect some of that and, and use that. Um, so I think that would be, that would be one way. Um, there also may be, um, some sort of thing where they're, they'll do, um, additional, um, additional clips online. Right. Um, so there, there's been some talk about that. So some of that stuff may, may be able to be seen. You heard it here first official announcement season two. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Uh, no, you have to imagine how many people have been asking about that. And that is something that is possible, but nothing official. No, yeah. There, I, and I really haven't even talked to the network yet about it. I think that they are, um, you know, they probably have to look at the numbers and the reviews and all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, you know, see if there's interest, but, you know, I keep getting, um, direct messages, um, from, from all kinds of people since the series aired, you know, of like horrific stories and, uh, from people who want to, you know, share, share what happened to them. And, um, and then a lot of people who are grateful about it. Um, and then people who want to tell their stories and, uh, you know, I wish I could, I, I wish I could give a platform to everyone. Um, but you know, it's just, it, it's not possible with the, the way, you know, streamers and networks are, cause they, they can't tell all those stories. I, I told someone recently, they were asking if I would ha change anything about the series or if there's anything I wish. And the way that I said it, and this is a quote I've said for years and years and years about all kinds of projects, but I've always loved the quote that perfection is not when there's nothing left to add. It's when there's nothing left to take away. And when I look at Let Us Pray, to me, it is the perfect version of what I hoped it would be. And yes, there's a million trail. Jack, Jack Scott could be an episode, a season. Jack Hiles could get a season of 20 episodes and you would scratch the surface. But to me, there's nothing. I walked away going, this is really, really good. And this encapsulates everything that I've been trying to communicate in four episodes in a masterful way. And that was actually the first phone call after part two ended. Rachel called me and she just said, this is really good. <laughs> and, and there was a sense of pride of being part of it because it is up until you're leaving this story in someone's hands. And as much trust as there is after all of this time, you still go, I hope they get it. And you really did. I think, and I think everyone online that you've seen supporting it feels the same way. Well, it means so much to me. And I know to Sam that, that people feel like we got it because really our, our number one audience was you guys, you know, you guys who participated in it. We wanted, we wanted you to feel good about it. And once you felt good about it, now we're like, great. You know, we want the, the rest of the world to see it and, um, and, and see the amazing courage that we saw in, in all the women. And it, it, it feels like they are. And you mentioned Rachel and I just love how she has just kind of emerged as this, um, I don't know, this just wonderful spokesperson for, um, for, for women and, uh, for survivors. Um, and she's just had a great presence online and, um, 
and she's just doing wonderful things with her social media. And she, she makes me laugh and, and she can yeah. make you cry. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, everybody. I, I, it's been really cool. I'm, I'm, again, I mentioned this on a interview recently and it was really cool that so many I had seen from afar, Rachel, I'd interviewed before, like, um, Kathy, April, I thought I'd interviewed before. And then we met in person. She's like, you've never interviewed me. I was like, I'm so sorry. I thought we had, cause we've talked a bunch, but it was really cool to be flying out to these places and meeting in person. And then to have that captured in little ways here and there on camera is just really neat. It's a cool, it, it was just a really cool experience. Um, but I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to sit here and compliment you and make you feel uncomfortable for the next 20 minutes. Um, but I, I do appreciate it. And I really, again, the way you approached it, I think it's the best way it could have been approached. And um, yeah, if if anybody wants season two, keep rewatching the series and let them know what the numbers. Um, going from that, I am curious about this. So the series, watching it premiere, watching the reactions, for me, when I watched it, my experience of part one was, this is incredible. I can't believe this is out here. And soaring, positive, happy emotion. It was a high, high. And then I said part two was like a low, low, where it was like, this is horrific. It like settles in like when you're watching Ruthie and you remember sitting in that courtroom and there's so much that got cut from that mm -hmm. whole scene you just get hit again with like how real this is and how much work there is still left to be done. And I'm curious for you, I know you've probably seen this millions of times by now, watching it on television live, seeing people's responses live, being in group chats with people who are featured. What was your overwhelming emotion as the credits roll on part two and this is out in the world? Ooh, um there was a real sense of release, um, like really like releasing this out into the world. Yeah. And it was just, that was so, it was really rewarding. I, I, yeah, I have watched that last scene because we've, you know, given notes on it and in the edit with it and always cried. I mean, I never watched that without tears. And, uh, and, the, and the tears were like, um, were even a little bit different because there were a couple happy tears in there with, uh, you know, more happy tears when it, when it was, um, when it was live, because it's like, we did it. We got, we, these women, these women's voices are out there and they were amplified and they're, you know, big as light out there. And that was it, you know, I've done a lot of projects and this project is really special to me in that. Um, it's people, people's voices who have been silenced were able to be amplified. I mean, it was the complete opposite of what had happened to them. So, um, that was a really special type of, of reward. Yeah. That ending sequence. And again, we're all there. I think, I think everybody in the main group of interviewees was there in the courtroom with Ruthie and I was tears from the beginning of episode. I mean, throughout the first two and then episode three to episode four, when it premiered live, I was just tears streaming all the way through that. It just settles in. And then hearing Ruthie's impact statement again, with the context of the, and the editing is amazing where it goes to the shots of, here's Amanda and here's her as a child. Here's Kathy and her as a child. Here's Rachel. It was such a beautiful thing that kind of represents the project as a whole of this is Ruthie's story, but this is a story I'm getting teared up talking about right now. This is a story that's um, been duplicated hundreds of times across how many decades now. And to see each of these survivors representing their own groups of people that relate to their stories it, it just hit really hard and um, it was a beautiful way to end that, to end that series. Um, and the judge, oh my gosh. Oh, when Ruthie movie? leans over, that was another tear moment when Ruthie leans over and says, he gets it. I was like, ah, like that, that to me was such a, it, it was such a powerful moment because 
the whole story up to that point is no one gets it. No one gets it. Someone even commented in one of the reviews or comments somewhere, and they said when a when a lawyer and a judge and have more understanding and empathy than the pastors, like we're in a tough spot. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and that was a tough get to get in that. I mean, you know, like we talked about yeah. earlier, just choosing which story to tell and and telling Ruthie's story. Our hope was that we would get into the courtroom. Well, yeah. there are plenty of courtrooms that do not allow filming. Right. And this was... Uh, Especially for criminal. Yeah. yeah. There were uh, lots of requests, a lot of back and forth. And then um, and then we finally got approval to go into the courtroom. And we we're like, yes, because this is the one that we were most banking on. And we were able to go into for Kathy Durbin as well. Um yeah. But, you know, that everyone was in masks and we had, you know, we were just, that was even, we hadn't even sold um, the series yet ne- necessarily. So we had, it was like, we were still in, in development with Kathy's, but, um, but yeah, I mean, just getting in there and then we, um, we had more people than I think they expected on our crew and they started like kind of saying like, Okay, now they were a little grumpy. Yeah, they were like you have to stay in this corner and you cannot move the camera and you can't have a boom moving around in here. And we're like, oh no. Okay, so we have this one corner and we were so hoping that we could get it. Like we thought we were going to at least get the side angle of Ruthie and Larissa, and we weren't able to. But then we found online, you know, it was like all this stuff we found online that we we had the we had the like the GoPro footage. So. We were able to get yeah. that in. I, I want to ask you specifically about that sequence. Um, you made the decision, and I loved how you worded it. You made the artistic decision not to hear Aaron Willen speak. I actually interviewed Ruthie recently, was asking her about that, and she said she loved that decision. Um, but I also asked, is there some part of you that wishes people could have heard I, and and you know, how sniveling and weaselly his lawyer and he both sounded in that courtroom? Um, and I remember specifically a collective ugh, when his lawyer said that he had found God um, in the courtroom. Did you go back and forth or was that a decision from the beginning of like, do we show him speaking in the courtroom or was it always, we're not going to listen to this guy anymore? Um, there was maybe uh, a second that we, <laughs> we thought about it. <laughs> quick second. Yeah, yeah. Quick second be- for the reasons that you're, that you're stating, because everyone could also have that experience of, Ew, like, what are you talking about? And why are you at, why do you think the judge is not a good defense? Yeah. I mean, there were everything he said would just was like, ooh, disgusting. Like, I don't even want to hear your voice. And then it was like, we can just put the X right on his mouth yep. and just not let him speak because hmm. we don't need his voice. Um, yeah. the voices of these women. So it was in that way, it was really kind of an easy decision and sort of a, you know, an empowering decision. Yeah. And poetic with a series that opens with, we will not be silenced to close with an abuser being silenced is pretty cool. Um, but two more questions on that. Um, how happy were you when the judge said there's something fundamentally wrong? Oh, <laughs> because unbelievable. The- I love that. And as a matter of fact, the first time I got a cut, without that in it <laughs> go back to the editor was i know the judge said this and i want that in there <laughs> yeah love that yeah love that. I love, um, I, yeah i love that there's one scene i know in particular because i got to see a little glimpse of it when we were filming and i know you you're probably most relieved that you don't have us bugging you to see any snippet or morsel of this project because i know when we were there filming in uh michigan i was kind of like can we see something is there like a you know and you showed me this Open original opening scene, which is you're filming with Ruthie, you're driving by the church, and people from the church get in pickup trucks. I was like watching the footage, like, is this cop? Like, what are we watching right now? This is like a chase sequence. Um, talk a little bit about what happened with that and then why it got cut. We were Ruthie was giving us kind of a uh driving tour of Gaylord and uh we went by the church and there were some people who recognized her uh just in the van and uh they started following us and uh it was it was it was kind of scary 
Um, and, um, so we had to, uh, and Ruthie was driving. And so her mom's like, well, just go to the police station, just go right to the police station so they can follow us right to the police station. And they, and they did. And, um, and it really upset Ruthie and she get, did an interview in the car at that time in the, in the van. And she said, you know, this is the kind of intimidation tactics that, that they use. Like they're going to just try to intimidate us. Yeah. And, um, and that was, it was really powerful and it was, um, it was what we call a cold open. So that was the beginning. And then we go to what is the title sequence, which is the thing with the music and you see every, it's kind of a super tease of the whole series. Um, but, um, yeah, then we, uh, then we had, we needed to cut, it was about two and a half minutes and we needed to cut two and a half minutes out. So hmm. that was hard to cut, but we did. Yeah. You mentioned obviously the intimidation and people having a negative response, even filming. Um, and I know probably negative responses as you're reaching out to clear footage and, and all of that, um, which I was so thankful through the process that I was not having to figure that out because trying to get all this footage of Hiles and, you know, in, I know just again, the variety of people trying to send here's clips, here's this, and then legal going through it. Um, was difficult. I, I, I'm curious now, one of the critiques of the series is the broad brushing. And I'm sure you've seen that. It broad brushes the movement. It broad brushes this. And then a step further is a lot of them will still say, we're not even a denomination. We're not even a, you know, um, which is so silly to me because, well, I'll let you answer this. Like you're an outsider. You're looking at this. Do you truly see any semblance of independence within the independent fundamental Baptist movement? It's a definite underground network that is very tightly knit. So yeah. I, I see it as a, as, as a system. I do yeah. not see it as independent. I mean, yeah. they're in, they think they're independent maybe from the rest of the world and any other rules that might apply to, uh, to human beings, but, um, not from each other. <laughs> I, don't, I, I didn't see it that way. And so it's very hard. I mean, I always have to catch myself and say independent. Fundamental Baptist churches versus church because it does yeah. feel like one monolith to me. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was rewatching the series last night with my wife to like just have it fresh in my mind going into this. And I was just sitting there with a notepad, just scribbling down notes. And I was looking and I was thinking, okay, we had a teacher at our school who used to work at Agape boarding school, my own school growing up. Um, my pastor was from Hiles Anderson. And we played sports against faith in Wildemar right near us. And so I was like, there's three points of connection there. If I want to go a level deeper, one of the people that was from my school actually worked with Kathy in California. So there's another, it's like, I was just sitting there going like, there's so many connections. The new pastor of, uh, of uh, first Baptist church used to pastor in California. And we go to conferences there. Like, I was just like, this idea of independence just doesn't add up when you start literally drawing. Like I did like a little grid drawing little lines and I was like, this, this is not independent. Like all of these stories are so interconnected. And um, anyway, it, it was just interesting to me. That's a common critique. Cause I was like, did you look at the documentary? Did you see, <laughs> look at the lines, just look at the lines. Pointing. We noticed. Um, so we, we did this thing where we had everyone, sit down and get settled in their, in their chairs for the, for the, mm -hmm. or wherever they were in the, in the interviews, which we could talk about the interview setups too. But, um, we didn't keep that for time except for Jamie Hiles. And one of the reasons was because we, we felt like we, we understand this culture now and we understand that she's a big get. And, and I've heard in some podcasts recently where someone said like, Oh my God, I, when I, when I saw Jamie Hiles, I was like, wow, they have her. And that's what Sam and I were going for. We were like, we, we want people to be like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to hear what she has to say. Yeah. And, um, so that was, it. and, and it was like, she, everyone did, everyone knows who she is. And even when telling people before, like even explaining to the network, like this is a big deal. Like this is the, like a celebrity in, um, right. you know, in, in this group. That last name, just seeing it pop up is a shocking, shocking thing. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the interview setups. I was going to go to listener questions, but since you mentioned it, I know it's important. 
I want to know about interview setups. There was one funny uh, review. I don't know if you saw on IMDb. Someone left a review and said, I feel bad for the girls in these uncomfortable <laughs> positions or these chairs. Um, that, but oh, yeah, to me, see that. Yeah. I, I, to me, I thought it was really cool. Like every setup, the first, um, like when I saw Ruthie set up in the one big church, I was like, that is such a cool setup. I was looking at all of those. Amanda's representing. Um, talk to me a little bit about the interview setups and how much time and thought went into each one. And uh, I'm still a little bitter. I didn't get to keep the radio wall for my uh, my home recordings. But. <laughs> well, maybe we can fix that. Um, I um, yeah, it was really important to us uh, to have the the interview environments be something really meaningful. And um, and of course, you know, from a filmmaking standpoint, we wanted it to be cinematic. Um, but we also wanted it to be collaborative with uh, with the women, and we didn't want to just throw them into any any old environment that we chose. So, um, sure, we did talk to everybody when we when we selected the the environments, and um, you know, people could had veto power, and there were a couple of women who didn't want a particular environment. But what we really wanted to say, and they seemed to really embrace this, was that we wanted it to be um, represent a reclaiming of a space. A space that may have been negative to them, that may have been taken away from them, may have been tainted in some way, and to show their growth and their healing. And this is a place that now they can go and and use their voice and say what they want to say and speak their truth um, in that environment as a way of reclaiming it. So, um, yeah, so like for Amanda Householder, she was in a room that represented the isolation room, which was in you know many of these uh, boarding schools that were horrific. And, um, and then there was Amanda Clydens who was on a bus and a lot of her stories. And she was one of the stories that we really couldn't get into as much as I would have liked to have, um, done. But she, um, she talked a lot about, she talked about the goldfish swallowing and about uh, school winning and being in the part of the bus ministry and, um, having to go and, and basically kidnap kids and put them on a bus so that they could count them as numbers in, in the soul winning contests. So, um, so that was, you know, that was another space. So, um, and then the Nat was in, um, was in a motel room and that's where, um, you know, David Hiles would frequently take her. But I just, I want everyone to know that it was, it, we really thought carefully about this and talked to the women and decided together on the backdrops for the, for their interviews. I'm going to throw one last question. I know I said that was the last one before we switched to listener questions, but you mentioned that it was heavily focused on female stories. I somehow wiggled my way into that lineup of people. Um, But it's also what I don't know that a lot of people realize is the entire crew for the most part was also female. And so female director, female producer, cinematographer who is incredible. female cinematographer, um, everybody was just, I mean, for the most part, I think everybody was female on the main production team. Um, why do you think that was so important to the story? And, you know, the question answers itself, but (laughs) if you will, um, why do you think it's so important to tell female stories through a female lens? So we really wanted to create, um, a production and environments that, um, felt safe to the women. I mean, that was like one of the most important things to us. We, we want, we want the women to feel safe and not that you can't feel safe around a man, but, uh, the, the odds are higher if you have women there, um, you know, part when, while you're telling your story. And so, yeah, Yamit Shaminovitz, our cinematographer, cinematographer was amazing. I mean, you, we would look over at times during interviews and, I'd be crying and Sam would be crying. And then you look over at you know, me who's behind the camera and she's crying. You know, it's just that heart that we definitely, you know, wanted there. And, and what's also, um, I don't think people always think about, but, um, was important to us too, was that our, that our sound recordists were women because, um, th- that's actually a person who has kind of the least amount of contact with someone during the, during the production. But they're listening to every word you say. And if you need to say something over again, or if her truck went by, she's the one that's kind of stepping in and saying, 
oh, can you can you say that again? She's also the one putting the mic on your on your shirt. So we felt like you know it's really important that we have um, female sound recordists. Love love all that perspective. Um, and I know great we to have, have you because and it was great to have me. It was great to have you because you you are such an encyclopedia. <laughs> Um, IFB and you're such a supporter of, of, of these women and you have your own story to tell. And when I was able to, as you know, that there was a, there's one version that has two more minutes in it in, in part one. And my, my go-to was to put your backstory in mm-hmm. how you got involved in doing the podcast that you're doing and the activist activism that you're doing is so important. Um, and, you know, all the women trust you and, um, you know, they love being around you and are not threatened by you in any way. And I just think, um, it's amazing. And you, you know, anytime we would go through transcripts because we're like, oh, we need someone to explain the King James Bible. Like, and we're like, oh, I'm sure Eric said something about that. So we'd look through the transcript and we'd have you, you know, when we yeah. throw you back in to, for a bite here and there, because you really, um, you're just really, you're knowledgeable and you're very articulate and you have a big heart. Oh, no, I, I appreciate that um, a lot. I, I know here we have a couple minutes left. I've got a couple listener questions. We've probably touched on some of these, so we can go kind of rapid fire through them. Um, but in case there's anything else that comes up in this last little bit, um, will there be a season two? We answered that question. That question has been asked so much. I posted in my group, like any questions for the director? Will there be a season two? Someone said, will there be a season two, three, four, five? Um, you know, well, there's, there's a long season list. Two because we have Kathy Durbin um, going to uh, yeah. trial. In January, right? Yeah, I think yeah. she has a pretrial hearing in January, but then it should follow after that. Um, and then um, and then Amanda Householder's parents going to trial. So um, there's definitely a lot more that we can work with i can tell you and i can give you more detail after i've had some people reach out to me with some massive stories that are some international some i mean i had someone reach out from a church multiple people all from the same church it's just it's sad that there's more stories to tell but i'm thankful that people feel comfortable to reach out and say maybe this one next um Mm -hmm. how do you determine what to cover we talked about that um was there a particular moment scene um discovery that you found particularly disturbing or something that really stuck with you throughout the entirety of the shoot and maybe even to now oh wow i'm sure there's a lot i mean there is a lot there was so much decompressing um afterwards and i and i know it was you know hurting for the women when they told their stories um because i just want to hug them all and be like Mm -hmm. how 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 could people treat you this way? So that was kind of the general feeling, um, you know, many times. Um, I was I I was very shocked by the 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 story about um, you know, of uh of Kathy and April and Rachel and how that all connected and how that was allowed. Like when I heard that, it was so mind blowing to me that it was I was like, what, what it, it took me. Cause actually Sam heard it first. And when she described it to me, I was like, wait a minute, slow down, say this all, all over again. Cause I, I'm not getting it right away. And that, yeah. that was very shocking. And then also it was very shocking. Um, you know, the going to the circle of hope with Amanda householder. Um, and, yeah. um, and then, you know, even Nanette's story, um, that that had been so many years ago. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and all the stuff with David Hiles, like, what is up with that? I don't know. I, I, well, I'll tell you something off air about that, but that, okay. that to me is one of the biggest mysteries of all of this is how he has evaded so much of this. And, uh, oh, and I have to tell you too, I was bl- when I watched the trailer and I saw Paul Celino in the um, in the uh, trailer, I didn't recognize him. I've watched that clip of him so many times, and then the minute I saw his name card flash up, I literally dropped my phone. I was like, "Oh my goodness!" Like, I can't believe they got him in there. But like to have guys like that 
who have been saying this for years. Yeah. There's an active case out. It's just mind blowing. And I hope in a future season, it's documenting him going behind bars. That would be the sweetest pleasure is to see some form of justice against Dave Hiles. Um, uh, what information is most unexpected? We covered that. Did you consider interviewing abusers for the series at any point? A little bit, but it was kind of like <laughs> one se- one quick second. <laughs> like yeah, like with Will, like I don't really, especially the ones that. Well, I yeah, I mean, we didn't really need to hear what they had to say because it would all be you know, like it would be what they've been saying publicly yeah. for the last. Yeah, but I did want to hear and did give John Jenkins the opportunity hmm. uh, to 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 tell his side of things which he declined. Did you speak to everyone who was featured who like, did you end up speaking to a David Hiles off air? Did you Dick talk to Scott? Did you David talk to Hiles declined okay. uh, to speak to me? And uh, John Jenkins did not want to be on camera. Hmm. Uh, Bruce Goddard did not return any phone calls. I can't believe that. I, I would expect them to be forthcoming with information. Mm-hmm. Um, someone asked, what was the time frame it was filmed over? Um, I told him three years, but production would be some of pre-production would be some of that. But really, it sounds like it was filming from day one to try to start piecing this together. Yeah, it was about three. Yeah, over three years. And then the pandemic, there was a little bit of slowdown there. But then there's, you know, we did all those casting reels and like where, where everyone we, you know, talked to. 25 people about their stories and wow wow um and then someone said um why did you limit to a small number of cases i think we kind of covered this as well like there's a lot to cover but it's kind of finding the ones that tell the story in the most coherent way um you know i'll kind of ask it this way is was there any point where you were going to go a lot smaller, where it was going to be focused specifically on just one church? Did you ever at any point want to go more full history where it's like starting in this date, so-and-so did this and go three, four episodes on that before even diving into the present? Like, How quickly did you determine like, hey, it's going to be like the generational story across these types of organizations? Well, we had three editors working for 10 months. So that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So that's almost, you know, two and a half years, really, if it was just one editor. Um, So we had lots of different versions. We always knew we wanted to tell the the backstory of the IFB and use some of that uh, incredible uh, archival stuff that's out there. Right. So we knew that. And then we tried to tell other stories. um, But you have to, like think about how much people can hold in their heads and how much they can really track sure. in terms of viewers. So it's really, it, it, it's a shame because I mean, even like, uh, like Brianna, like we have right. more of her story that we, we just didn't have for time. Um, and so you just kind of have to pick the stories that you can tell the most of, because, you know, look at Ruthie's story. I mean, it spans four episodes because there's so many different parts to it. Yeah. And um and Kathy's story. Um and then Amanda, you know, all that the the um unregulated boarding schools really needed its own episode. So uh, the yeah, the issue is time. <laughs> and that's the <laughs> challenge. And we actually did try to pitch to have two more episodes. We we're like, we have so much more material. Can we just do two more episodes? Um, but that was a no. <laughs> so we had to like really fit it into Four episodes of 41 minutes each. Don't envy the editors of that. But it, it, like I said, I I think it's the perfect version of what it could have been. I think there's nothing that I would change about how it exists in its current state. Um, I'm really thrilled with how it came out. I really appreciate your work in this. And, you know, I know we don't speak too often, but getting to reconnect every couple months along the way has been really cool. And uh, I'm just so thankful for you taking the time to focus on this. And as I said to you, after it all came out, I the only thing I could think to say is it was extremely validating. And, um, you know, this is something that for me as a 16-year-old kid going, no one's ever going to listen to this and meeting 
hundreds of people now that have all expressed that same feeling. I know that now there's a feeling of validation that, hey, the world is literally watching and they're hearing these stories. And that is, I think, one of the most beautiful gifts that you can give somebody. And so I want to say thank you for me and for, I mean, on behalf of literally people texting me today saying, hey, just say this, like, mm-hmm. we're thankful for it. Um, people are so thankful for this project and I'm I'm beyond grateful whether it ever gets another season, whether this is the, this is it as it exists today. Um, I will always be grateful for the opportunity and for the project you put together. Well, thank you. I, it was, it really, I know people say this and it sounds trite, but it was like such an incredible honor to, um, to hold these stories, you know, with both hands and then be able to like, let them fly out into the world. It's really, really re- an honor and really rewarding. So I thank you. And I thank you, Eric, especially for like being always the go-to in the edit, like Eric, this person and how is this person related to that person? And do you have any, do you have any footage of this or do you have any, and you would always deliver. So I really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you to everybody listening. If you haven't watched, let us pray yet. I don't know why you just listened to this whole episode. Uh, go to max and go tune in. Uh, but for now, Sharon, thank you so much for joining me and I will see everyone else on future episodes. Thank you.